In this video, we're still talking about subspaces, and we're talking about a specific finite set of vectors which belong to a subspace, which is called a basis. So we have this word basis, which we have seen before when we talked about standard basis vectors. And so the plural of basis is base E. So you have an E there, and it makes a long E sound. So we're going to talk about really what is a basis. So let's do a little bit of review and preview. If we have a non-empty set of vectors, then we saw that the span of that set of vectors forms a subspace. And if we have a subspace W, if we pick a set of vectors from W, which spans W, we call it a spanning set. And what does it mean to say that a set of vectors spans W? Well, that means that any vector in W can be generated using a linear combination of the vectors in the spanning set, in this case in our set U. So that's the idea of a spanning set. The spanning set can be used, the spanning set for a subspace can be used to generate the all the vectors in the subspace. So if we start with a spanning set and it is linearly dependent, uh, in a very real sense, then we have too many vectors. It's redundant. There are really uh, there's vectors in there that are giving us redundant information. They're not giving us any independent new information about the uh, span of that vectors. So since it's linearly dependent, at least one of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the remaining vectors. And so let's just suppose that that vector is Vn. Then I can go ahead and remove that vector Vn from our set, get a new set, which we'll call S prime, and we're not going to change the span. The span of S prime is going to be the same as the span of S. That is, the span of uh, the new set where we have removed this vector, which is a linear combination of the remaining vectors, uh, did not change the span. Now I've got a new set S prime. I've removed V sub n. If I find out that that S prime set is still linearly dependent, I'm going to repeat the process. There's got to be some vector in S prime, and we'll just call it V sub j now, uh, which can be written as a linear combination of the remaining vectors. So I'll throw that one out, and I'll get a new set called S double prime. And Throwing out both those vectors, v sub n, v sub j, uh, did not change the span. So I still have a spanning set. And I can continue this until I get to a linearly independent set. And so uh, just a note on the notation, just like with derivatives, we can have an s prime, an s double prime, and s triple prime. But after s triple prime, we just start using a superscript. So uh, after k, steps of this process, we would have a set S, K. But that uh, set is going to be linearly independent. And those vectors form what we call a minimal spanning set. So we generated a subspace through the span of S, and we threw out all of the vectors that were redundant, and now we're left with a minimal spanning set. If I throw out another vector, I'm going to change the span. So once I get to a linearly independent set, I stop this process. That's my minimal spanning set. That's the minimal number of vectors I need 
to span the set. So that just says that we a minimal spanning set exists, but how do we calculate it? Well, we're going to return to our number one tool, which is the Gauss-Jordan algorithm. It's going to help us find which vectors we can keep and which ones are redundant. So which ones have to belong to our minimal spanning set and which ones can be thrown out. So if we start with a set of n vectors, we're going to go ahead and create a matrix uh, by uh, letting the columns of the matrix be the vectors in our set. And then we'll reduce that to reduced row echelon form. We'll call that matrix R. And we'll define our set S prime to be those vectors whose corresponding column in R are leading columns. That is, that they have a leading one. So the corresponding leading columns from A form the set S prime. That's going to be a minimal spanning set. So the vectors there are linearly independent. And then any uh, vector which is not a leading column or does not correspond to a leading column can be written as a linear combination of the vectors in S prime. In the, it can be written as a linear combination of the columns corresponding to the leading columns. So let's make this clear that a minimal spanning set is both minimal and linearly independent. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you take start with the spanning set, and from that the span of those vectors, you pick just randomly m vectors and uh, call that new set L. Well, what can I say? If I chose more vectors than I started with in my spanning set, then it has to be linearly dependent. Why does that make sense? Well, we don't know much about S, but we do know that it's a spanning set. So it could be a minimal spanning set, or it could be bigger than a minimal spanning set. But a minimal spanning set has no more than n vectors, because that's what I started out with. If I take more than those n vectors, then I've got redundant vectors. Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, a minimal spanning set, right? It wouldn't span the space if I had thrown out too much stuff. So if I add in additional vectors, then those vectors must be linear combinations of the other vectors, so uh, the set would be linearly dependent. Uh, and then another way of saying that is if you choose m vectors from the span of S, and they, that set of m vectors is linearly independent, then uh, m can be no greater than n. So we know that the span of a non-empty set of vectors is a subspace. And then the question would be, must every subspace be the span of a set of vectors? Well, we certainly saw that that was true in R2 and R3. And it is true in higher dimensions as well. If we take any non-null subspace, so again, we have to treat the um, the null subspace a little bit differently. Um, we can find a set of vectors uh, such that a uh, set of vectors S which span W, which is a spanning space, spanning set for W. And since we generated W from the span of S, then of course S is a spanning set, and any 
vector in W can be generated by a linear combination of vectors in S. And now if we have a set B, which is a spanning set, so it spans W, and is linearly independent, that set is called a basis for W, basis for the subspace W. Uh, and again, the plural of the word basis is bases, pronounced bases, long E. So formal definition of a basis. A set is a basis for W, uh, provided that it spans W and is linearly independent. In other words, a basis is a linearly independent spanning set. So some examples. Uh, the standard basis vectors, we've been using that uh, term, is indeed a basis for Rn. A line through the origin, uh, whether it's an R3 or R2, the direction vector forms a basis for the line. If you have a plane in R3 and we'd like to find a basis, well, then we just need to find two vectors. And why two vectors? Remember, it's a two-dimensional object. You need two vectors to generate the uh, plane. And we need them to be linearly independent if they're going to be basis vectors. And what does linearly independent mean for two vectors? That they're non-parallel. So we need to find two non-parallel vectors in the plane. And we can do that by inspection. We could just say, well, let me find three values for x, y, and z, where 4x plus y minus 3z equals 0. So for example, I could use 1, negative 1, and 1. And then I just need to find a different vector, which is not parallel to that. And I chose 3, 0, 4. So inspection is something that we want to uh, learn how to do uh, to help us move on. But sometimes it's not obvious what uh, numbers you can choose, especially if you don't have simple integers for your coefficients. So uh, what we can do is go back to our uh, Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan algorithm. So we look at the Cartesian equation as a system of equations with only one equation. Uh, but it has an augmented matrix. And in this case, I'm writing the 0 out explicitly. This is a homogeneous system. But I'm going to go ahead and write it out. And its uh, reduced row echelon form is very simple. You just need to get a leading 1. Uh, and so you divide every term by 4. And what does that say? Well, I only have one leading variable, which is x, and two free variables, which are y and z. So I'll use the parameter r for y, and use the parameter t for z. And then I'll solve for x. x will be 3 fourths uh, t minus 1 fourth r. So my vector solution. Uh, would have the parametric form 3 fourths t minus 1 fourth r as the first component, r as the second component, and t as the third component. And of course I can factor out, I can write that as two vectors by factoring out the parameters. So what can I say then? That any vector in the plane is a linear combination. That's exactly what this is showing. That any vector in the plane is a linear combination of the vector minus 1 fourth, 1, 0, and 3 fourths, 0, 1. In other words, we can say that that is a spanning set. It's linearly independent. Um, and it is going to be a basis. But it's awkward to work with vectors that have uh, fractions in them. But remember, if you start with a spanning set, if you multiply each of the vectors in the spanning set by a scalar, 
doesn't have to be the same scalar, um, but we want to clear out the fractions. So we're going to multiply both of those uh, vectors by 4, and then I'll get uh, nicer vectors, vectors without fractions, and I didn't change the spanning set. So I'm going to use this set, which has integer components, to be my basis for the plane. Alright, so let's emphasize that if you have a, a set of vectors and you form their span, then that set of vectors is going to be a basis if and only if it is linearly independent. And again, let's go back and think about this in terms of our Gauss-Jordan algorithm. That, uh, if I start with a set of vectors and I let W be the space which is spanned by that set, I populate my matrix A with the columns of those vectors, transform it to reduced row echelon form, get the matrix R, then the columns of A correspond to leading columns of R, form a basis. So what this is saying is that a minimal spanning set, because we used this idea to obtain a minimal spanning set before, so a minimal spanning set is indeed the same thing as a basis. And let's just do an example here. I've got three vectors in R4, and we're going to look at, at uh, W being the span of those three vectors, and we'd like to find a basis for W. So, I go ahead and form the matrix A. First column, make sure I got all those numbers correct. Second column, again, that looks good. Third column, uh, looks right. And we transform that to reduced row echelon form. And we can see that uh, we have two leading columns and, or, and one free variable here. So, the vectors corresponding to the leading columns in R, that would be V1 and V2, those form a basis. Now, we don't need to show that V3 uh, it can be written as a linear combination of V1 and V2 when we're just talking about basis vectors, but just for practice, let's remember that V3 can be written as a linear combination of v1 and v2 using the coefficients in the third column. So it would be negative 3v1 plus 2v2. So every non-null subspace has a basis. We can't say the null subspace has a basis. You can say that the zero vector is a spanning set, but it's not a basis because what do we know? A basis has to have linearly independent vectors, and any set that contains the zero vector is going to be linearly dependent. So it's a special case that we set aside. But every non-null subspace has a basis. Now, the basis is not unique in general. Right? Um, that uh, you may have an infinite number of bases, but they have one common property. That is that they have the same number of vectors because they're all minimal spanning sets. And if you think about our uh, geometric obje objects, if we have a line uh, through the origin, that is a one-dimensional object. A plane through the origin is a two-dimensional object. It has two basis vectors. So this idea of dimension can be uh, generalized to describe, in a, in a sense, the number of independent directions in any subspace. So, since any basis m is a s minimal spanning set, it must contain the same number of vectors, and we're going to call that the dimension of the subspace. So the dimension of a subspace is the number of vectors in any basis. And we just write DIM as an abbreviation 
Uh, we may say that W is k-dimensional if the dimension of W is k. And uh, what about that null uh, subspace? Well, by convention, we just say that its dimension is 0. So it doesn't fit exactly into our uh, definition. So we treat it separately. We just agree that the dimension of the null subspace or zero subspace is zero. So I hope the idea of basis and dimension is clear. We're going to be using it throughout the rest of the course.